back. Everybody in the back, you can hear me, right? If you cannot hear me, raise your hand. You're fine. All right. So um, today I'm going to mostly use the blackboard. If there's time, I might show you some slides, but I do not know. Because actually, uh, I have a very ambitious agenda, which I doubt that I can complete. Um, but at least I will give you a flavor of things. I will try to derive the first and second scenarios uh, rigorously, uh, to some extent. Uh, still, we have limited time. And then there are other scenarios. Um, I may just give you brief descriptions on the key concepts. Because actually, I think this lecture, if I want to derive everything uh, in details, I will probably need three hours. And we only have an hour and a half. So, um, so I will try to do what I can. So the, the story today I'm going to tell you is that in topological insulators, there are special properties associated with topological insulators. And then you can actually realize um, a very interesting thing that um, a very interesting phenomena that uh, particle physicists have been looking for for a long time, meaning the Marana modes. Well, I don't call them Marana fermions. Uh, for, for a good reason. Marana fermions in elementary particle <coughs> physics, they are real fermions, and then uh, they themselves are their own antiparticles. But in condensed matter physics systems, actually, what we will be seeing, there are many body uh, interaction induced um, excitation modes. So they're due to many body effects. They are not individual particles that you can isolate. So these days, if you hear people talking about, oh, how to observe uh, runoff fermions in, uh, uh, in condensed matter physics systems, I would call them misnomer because it's not a good way of calling them Marana fermions. They're actually Marana modes. So I will try to make that, uh, uh, make, make this point. Uh, they, are, it, they are excitation modes that we try to observe. So you may ask, why, why do I care about Marana modes? Well, because they're interesting. For one thing, it's something of fundamental importance, fundamental physics. We human beings differ from other animals because we're curious. We want to understand fundamental physics, fundamental science. That's one motivation. The other motivation is that Marana fermions, they are unlike boring fermions. When you exchange two fermions, you follow Fermi statistics. You exchange two particles, you pick up a negative sign. But Marana fermions, they are not uh, typic your typical fermions. Uh, when you exchange two Marana fermions, you will pick up a non-abelian uh, interaction. So what that means is you know, non-abelian means non-commutative. So if you exchange two uh, Marana fermions and you rotate it back to their own original positions, you will actually pick up non-trivial matrices. And so what that means is that it could be very interesting <coughs> for people saying, oh, you can use them probably for topological uh, quantum computation. That's also not quite true, let me emphasize, because Marana fermions, you exchange them, they don't have very complex structures like certain types of uh, non-abelian anions. They're non-abelian, but they're not complex enough. Um, in fractional quantum Hall systems, there are these things called non-abelian anions. Non-abelian anions, they, if they are complex enough, they can give rise to very interesting properties. You can do universal quantum computation. But Marana fermions are, no, are, are not so complex. Yes, they obey non-abelian statistics, but they are not complex enough. But they will be useful for quantum, some kind of quantum information, some kind of quantum storage, because they're topological in nature. They cannot be easily uh, annihilated. You, you, can, you can play with them, and you can store them, um, and they, they are more robust. So they're topological objects, and so that's what's, why it's interesting. Um, I have this, um, I always do this. I try to tell the students why I'm telling them something. Why do you have to sit here for the rest of the 90 minutes listening to me? Um, why is it interesting? So I try to tell you for fundamental physics reasons. I also try to tell you for quantum information, quantum storage. It can be interesting. And so actually, there, there are a lot of experimentalists trying very hard to look for Marana modes in condensed measure physics systems. And here I laid out these schemes. These are the schemes actually proposed by theorists. 
true date, lots of people are working on them, but I would say that none of the experimental results are truly conclusive yet. Um, but still, the, 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 uh, the hunt is ongoing, and so it's an exciting time, and that's why we are going to learn a little bit about why, why, what's going on. Um, so I will start with Kitaya's toy model. He is a colleague of mine at Caltech. Uh, he is the person who actually created topological quantum computation using anions, and he was also the person that first proposed this very interesting idea of looking at one-dimensional spinless P-wave superconductors to uh, realize to uh, run on those. You may say, wait a second, that sounds totally crazy. Right? Of course, we have spins in electrons, and, and also um, a lot of you may know when you go to low dimensions, low dimensional systems are unstable. Um, they have strong fluctuations and all kinds of problems. And then P-wave superconductors are very rare, very rare in nature. So what the heck are you talking about? Well, be patient. I will show you. I will show you first this toy model that actually gives you very straightforward, clean physics. But then you may ask, how do I realize such a system? And that's related to all the rest, that people can actually design things in a way effectively in their Hamiltonian understanding one-dimensional stimulus P-wave superconductors. Um, so I will show you how that can be done. Um, at least, probably, um, yeah, maybe one, two, or maybe up to three. Um, and these, I, I do want to touch upon. Uh, it's very interesting. You don't even need topological insulators. You can just take a semiconducting wire and put it near a superconductor, start realizing interesting properties. OK, so let's. Um, Let's start with this a little crazy, um, but actually very interesting toy model. Um, this is a Alexa Kitayak's model. So you think about a one-dimensional crystal, and, and it's a P-wave superconductor. Um, why do I want a P-wave superconductor? Well, in a second, I'll explain it. But let me first write down the Hamiltonian. Um, so this is a crystal. It's a P-wave superconductor, and it's spinless. So when it's spinless, and so I have these indices, j side, j plus one size. So this is chemical potential. For those of you, if you don't know second quantization, I'm sorry, but everything will be expressed in second quantization. And for any physicist, you should know second quantization as your second nature. constant t between two sides. And so if I have, so I want t to be positive so that I can lower the energy and I have a chemical potential. This is a superconducting gap. So I will abbreviate superconducting using SC, superconducting gap. <coughs> and, uh, and this is a phase. Uh, as you know, a superconductor has a well-defined phase. I mentioned that yesterday. Okay, um, now in such a system, so basically we have, um, as you can see, I do not have spin <coughs> indices. In real superconductors, you always see people write down spin up, spin down. But here I don't have spin indices, so this is spinless fermion operator. Now this is still an ordinary fermion. I'm not introducing Marana modes yet. Um, and I have t greater than or equal to zero, delta greater than or equal to zero. That means I have a superconducting gap. Um, and so, now if I want to form pairing, and uh, in this case, uh, because I have spinless, and because of Pauli exclusion principle, Conjecturing a spinless system, uh, what I want is that I must have spinless states has odd parity. <coughs> um, it must have odd parity. I 
And so the simplest situation, the lowest momentum case, would be P wave. You can say, can I ask, have F wave? Yes, you may. That's also a possibility. But it gets more complicated. And generally, if you can keep things easy, simple, do it. OK, so we have P wave. Um, At some point, I need to erase those things. Okay, um, so we have this crystalline structure, and let's assume we have periodic boundary conditions. So if we have periodic boundary conditions, if you have that, then of course the momentum is a good quantum number. I can do. Uh, I can move things to momentum space. So I can define this. Okay, these are typical Dirac fermion operators. So I can define something looking like, um, I will have this C, which is actually a matrix. I can write it like this. I have this C matrix. And then I can rewrite my Hamiltonian. And now this is a crystal. So I have K belongs to the entire one-dimensional Bruin zone. So you can, this is a two by two matrix. So this is a one by two. This is a, a two by one. And this is a two by two matrix. So you multiply them out. That's your total Hamiltonian. Now H of K will be like this. So I will give you the answer. Because um, you can try a homework problem to solve this on your own, but that's not my point right now. So I will, I will give you the answer, and because there are other important points I want to address. So E of K <coughs> is like this. As such. So if I am in the small momentum limit, as you will see, this delta k will be proportional to k. So this pairing potential is actually an odd function of k, um, whereas here it's an even function. Okay, so now with this thing written out, this is um, this is what I diagonalize my Hamiltonian. Um, no, I have not diagonalized my Hamiltonian, but I write it in this expression. Okay, so now let's look at the energy. So now overall, uh, with this expression, you can actually, so all of these, you can derive them on your own. But I will give you the answer. Now, I can start writing things in terms of Bogoliabov quasi-particle operators. I know some of you may not have learned about superconductivity. So when you have a <coughs> superconducting state, actually the quasi-particles, well, they are excitations of, um, you break apart Cooper pairs. So you can break apart, if the Cooper pairs are electron-electron pairs, you break them apart, you actually form quasi-particles. Or you can also have quasi-holes and then you break them apart, um, and there are quasi holes, and you have electron hole branches, and these are quasi particle operators. <coughs> there are also fermions. So these are called um, <coughs> quasi particles. When you are in a superconducting state, the quasi particles you mix electrons and holes together. You have particle hole symmetry, actually. And so, um, so these Bogolev of quasi particle operators can be written in terms of electron and hole branches. So, for instance, 
says, this positive for operator can be written in terms of an annihilation operator. So this is like uh, in the whole branch. So a whole branch is, course, is similar to annihilating a positive particle uh, in the electron branch or creating a hole. Uh, so this minus k is measured relative to the Fermi momentum. So this could be below the Fermi surface. And so this is the whole branch, and this is the electron branch. Superconductivity, I'm sorry, this is a little complex. But these are not the key points. The key points, as you will see, is, uh, is going to happen in a second. Um, but these are still important concepts to keep in mind. So I try to, all I'm doing now is that I start with a Hamiltonian. It's a very simple Hamiltonian. I just say that I have particles, and I feel particles to cause me chemical potential, and then I have floating coefficient, and somehow, miraculously, this thing decides to be a superconductor, but if it decides to be a superconductor, if you insist that it's spinless, then you must have it as P wave. So with that, you can start writing down the solutions um, for, for the energy state. Um, actually, let me mention one point. Spinless may not be truly spinless. For instance, you can have a system that you polarize your spins completely. A lot of you are working on spintronics. When you completely polarize your spins, the spin degrees of freedom is, is frozen out, so you can call it spinless, okay? Um, so that's another way of doing it, um, and reviewing it. So, so, but if we call it spinless, we know that we must have P wave um, in order to satisfy Pauli exclusion principle. Okay, so if all these things are done, um, I also want to give you the solution. So these are like coefficients associated with the electron and hole branches. And in a superconducting state, quasi-particle excitations always mix electron and hole branches. You have particle hole symmetry. And so actually that's one motivation. Why? You want to look into something that has that has superconductivity um, together. Because superconductors have this natural way of blending electrons and holes together. But of course, you can if you take this quasi-particles, this and this. It's creation operator and annihilation operator. They cannot be equal to each other, right? And so it's not enough just to have superconductivity. And we want to look for something that would allow our creation and annihilation operators operating on something give you the same thing. That's why you have Maharana modes. That's what we're looking for. But the motivation of looking at, at superconductor is really thinking of mixing electron and hole particles together. So that's the idea. Um, at least, you know, in hindsight, that's why I guess why Kitayat was thinking. Okay, so these are solutions. You can write them out. Um, and these are not much different from what you typically see uh, in, when you study superconductivity. side because something later I will have similar solutions. So I'll achieve this. As you know, when you try to solve the energy spectrum, you diagonalize the Hamiltonian, uh, the Hamiltonian matrix. And this will be your eigenvalues. Okay, so that's all fine. You look at this dot, it's very complex. But actually things can be much, much simplified. Um, what we want to see is, we want to see when we have gapless excitations. This energy, E bulk, is the excitations for quasi particles. And so you look at it and say most of the time it's going to be a positive energy. That means you have a superconductor and of course there's an energy gap. I mentioned to you yesterday, when you form Cooper pairs, they're effectively um, bosons, so you, they can both condense and creating an energy gap uh, in most cases. But I want to find a gapless solution because if I'm looking for Maharana modes, I must go with something that's gapless so that my positive and negative and the creation and the relation side has the same energy and, and that 
sometimes you need a zero energy. Because positive and negative energies, you don't understand that you only have one solution. That's zero energy. Okay, so that's what we want to do. Um, so, the chain admits gapless bulk excitation. This is what we want to look for. At mu equals to t or minus t and k equals to zero and pi. Um, or plus minus pi. These are the only possibilities. We can look at this together. If mu is equal to t, so you look at um, mu is equal to t. So if mu is equal to t, then if I have pi here, then it's possible that I can have this ek goes to 0. Also, um, OK, if, if um, yeah, say if, so that's the case. Or I could have mu equals to minus t. So if mu is equal to minus t, k is 0, then this gap goes to 0. K is 0 and mu is equal to minus t, then this term also goes to 0. I do have energy, zero energy solutions. <coughs> and so you can examine the situation. These are the only possibilities that truly get zero energy solutions. OK. Um, all right, so those are en zero energy solutions. And then what you do is that um, you also know this, this gap spectrum is odd. Okay. okay, so what this means is that Cooper Perry is forbidden <coughs> at k equals to 0 and plus minus k. So you have some energy, zero energy modes. You force them to 0 k or plus minus pi. And they won't form Cooper pairs. There are two zero energy, um, um, basically, my run on those. We will see. OK, um, so that's all fine. Um, all right. OK, um, so, so these give us the energy spectrum. Now, we want to look at. Um, we want to look at under what circumstances I'm going to tell you that there are two possibilities. You can have a trivial state, or you can have a topological state. <coughs> and how do we actually understand whether a state is uh, trivial or topological? Um, one way of looking at it is that you write your h of k in terms of some vector. I call it hk dot polyspin matrix. So what's a polyspin matrix? Everybody knows what a polyspin matrix is, right? So I don't need to write it up. Good. <laughs> um, so I write this, this polyspin matrix for polyspin matrices. Okay. So I will write my H of K in terms of polyspin <coughs> matrices. Um, and then you will see some properties, for instance, um, um, if I look at h, x and y component as a function of k, then I have minus h, x k, minus k, and h z itself is h z minus k. As you can see from that matrix, okay? You can see it that um, the x, y component, you write it out in poly matrices, decompose it, so you have the z component that's um, um, that's even, um, and you have the x y component that's odd, and then that, that will be the expression. So why do I want to look at things this way? Well, when I write it like that, then I see that if I make k to zero, okay, then immediately I have a quantity. At k equals to zero, it's only along z direction, right? When I say k to zero, uh, you can look at this. 
And so I only have the C component because remember, I'm multiplying the polyspin matrix. And if I have the pi component, then there will be something also. These are the two quantities. From momentum equals to zero to momentum equals to pi, there will be, um, if you write this out, this H is a vector. It will always point along the Z direction. Now, the thing is I'm going to define a quantity. I call that new. This new quantity will be equal to S0 times S pi. And it turns out that this quantity has two possible values. This quantity will always be either 1 or minus 1. And when it's equal to 1, this is a trivial state. And when it equals to minus 1, this is a topological state. When do I have a trivial state? Um, so this is like, you think about H as if it's a vector. So it's a vector on a sphere. Now, when you go, k equals to 0 is pointing along the north pole, let's say, or the south pole, either way. And you go around, you start increasing your k values. And then it will tilt away from that um, sphere. This is something, let me try to draw a picture. I'm never a good artist, so you imagine that. Say, so, so these, let, let me finish writing things. Okay, so we have color chops. Yes. In the trivial case, it actually happens when mu is smaller than minus t. And for the topological case, it's when mu absolute value is always smaller than t. So you can examine this situation. For instance, if, so let me look at k equals to zero. Let me walk you through this. Or should I, should I just leave it the way it is if you examine it? Um, okay, let me give you one example. So when k is equal to zero, you look at the solution. So e k, k is equal to zero, then I, I have e k is minus t minus mu. <coughs> So ek is minus t minus mu. So if mu is smaller than minus t, then what does that mean? That means mu plus t minus is greater than zero, right? So that means um, this s0, I would pick a positive number. It's positive one. Then I go around. So at k equals to zero, I start with a wave vector uh, that's at that's pointing, that's in the north pole. Now as I move away, um, when I start increasing the pi uh, k value, when I go to k equals to pi, so let's look at, when k is equal to pi, then ek is mu minus t, okay? But um, mu is smaller than minus t, so this is smaller than zero. Um, so s zero is minus one. But then let me, let me look at the, um, no, that's s, sorry, x pi is minus one. So I have minus one times minus one, right? k equals to zero, uh, what, what's that? When, okay, let um, right, okay, I want it, I want to show you, yeah, it's the product, so one of them, so if, if I have this condition, right, um, mu minus t, okay, so do it again. Um, under this condition, I should always, S0, I think S0 is 